Uh, so first of all, thank you for coming. Um, I thought I'd start with this. This is one of my uh, previous publication. I thought it was way more interesting than something that totally you say, what a yawn. Uh, I don't know how many of you know Bruce Lee. I know that some people do, the older people. <laughs> I know they see some young, young faces. I'm not sure you know who Bruce Lee is. I'm just going to ask the young people. Do you know who he is? No, young people. <laughs> <laughs> you do? You, who is he? Who was he, I should say? He was a martial artist. He's a martial artist. Okay. Anybody else? Nobody? Okay. Well, by last name, he's also Asian. <laughs> Just in case you missed that part. Okay, so this is a part, this is a paper I did with a former colleague of mine who taught here before, uh, Dr. Reinhardt, who's now moved to New Zealand. Um, on physical powers in uh, body and so forth. Now why is this is like apparently the topic doesn't have anything to do with sport, right? Sport, I would do something Bruce Lee playing basketball, which he didn't. Um, but if you think about what is sport anyways, sport is a movement full time and space, really, I mean you break it down and you need a body to do that. So the body becomes a very important instrument in terms of sport, whether you're performing or you're watching. Uh, so body is very important component in the study of uh, sports in general. So let me just give a little bit, since some of you don't know who Bruce Lee is, I'll give you some background information. I'm a sport historian by training, so we tend to look at history, context, very, very important in terms of understanding where we are right now. So let's start as Bruce Lee as an iconic figure. And if you don't, I see that every now and then the, uh, some of the older channels, American Movie Classic and whatever, will have some Bruce Lee movies. Uh, if you're interested, or, or Spike, that was the man channel. Um, if you're interested and in after this talk, uh, you might pay attention that when the movie came out. Um, some uh, context. Ping pong diplomacy and Nixon. Nixon is, of course, American President Richard Nixon. So in the 1970s, early 1970s, um, there was a thawing of relationship between the United States and, and China. China, for the longest time, has been hiding what they call a bamboo curtain. There's an iron curtain which is put up by Soviet Union. The bamboo curtain is put up by China to isolate itself from the larger world. In fact, China d did not participate in any international sport competitions up to that point, uh, simply because they sub subscribe to the communist ideology which believes anything Western is decadent. Uh, and they had no good relationship with the Western nations. But in 1971, the then uh, United States President uh, Richard Nixon paid an unprecedented visit to China and was well received. And then Prior to that, there was a groundwork being laid in, in the World Championship in table tennis. By the way, ping pong is not the uh, correct term for table tennis. Ping pong is what you play in the backyard in your basement. Right? So the, but they did call it ping pong diplomacy because it's easier to say. Uh, in the World Championship uh, table tennis tournament, which China always dominated, uh, there was a uh, talk from the American contingent to arrange a tour to China, which was accepted. So and that laid the groundwork for Nixon's visit to China and subsequently the thawing of relationship between the United States and China, which leads to now China is the biggest uh, debt holder of United States debt. So that sets a stage as China becomes important in the consciousness of Americans, if not the world, because of Nixon's visit. And things Chinese become popular again. For Bruce Lee, for himself personally, he was the first Asian to play in a substantive role in American television. Um, you can ask your grandparents um, about television in the 50s and 60s. You hardly ever see a Asian character. And for movies, sometimes you do see it, uh, but they usually either play a very insignificant role, 
as in again I'm gonna throw things out for those of you are young too young to know there's a television sh show called Bonanza uh, which is a Western um, I don't know anybody you would know in that <laughs> um, but there's a Chinese character his name is Hop Sing who is the servant so that's kind of minor role in television so either they play a minor role or evil role uh, Dr. Fu Manchu who is the evil genius uh, so but Lee on the other hand actually play a substantive role as a good guy he play as a psychic again not the main character now this is important in the next in the in the talk as a psychic, as the main hero, the Green Hornet, which was re-released re uh, early in 2012, I think, or 13. Um, so, but he has a regular place in it. And this becomes very important, not only because he is a regular on the show, at, even though it's a psychic, but pretty quickly, people recognize watching television that as a psychic, he was much more than that. And then, of course, he also have a couple of martial arts school in Seattle. He went to Utah, I'm sorry to say. Uh, he never graduated, I'm happy to say. Uh, but as a side gig, he promotes uh, martial arts and now this is a really earth-breaking a groundbreaking a move on him because for the longest time martial arts is basically martial arts school is basically limited to Chinese teaching Chinese the idea especially in the United States the idea is that Chinese have been discriminated against since the 1860s so and there's very really little that these Chinese migrant or immigrants can do anything about it. And sometimes they get beaten up, sometimes their business got burned down, and the worst case is they get murdered. And in fact, not too far away from here in Idaho, there was a mass massacre of Chinese uh, back in the late 19th century because of the gold rush. And they found some gold, they tried to Tastes like a came and basically a bunch of white people come in and killed all of them. Uh, so it, 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 these things happen. So for the practice of Chinese uh, martial arts, it was handed down that we only teach Chinese to defend ourselves. So for Bruce Lee to establish a Chinese school in Seattle, and not only that, he takes anybody. He would take, it doesn't matter who you are, he would take anybody who would want to learn. And this is quite a groundbreaking against a tradition, pra traditional practice. Only Chinese will teach Chinese. And he actually got in trouble with some of the other Chinese martial arts masters in the area. Uh, basically telling me you shouldn't be doing that. And apparently, according to legend, there have been fights to settle the score uh, amongst themselves. So this, this is the kind of the uh, background of Li um, and the reason why he becomes so important in Chinese culture. Um, so, how did, how did he get that way? Well, if you can read this, other than Dr. Shin and Dr. Kim, I'd be very impressed. This is actually his Chinese name. Um, this is actually, this is Li. He was born in 1940 in San Francisco. That makes him American. He was born while his father, who is a very famous opera star, was on tour in San Francisco. And his mother, on the other hand, was of mixed heritage. He's German and Chinese. Okay, very beautiful woman. Now, if you look at his birthday, this is just before Second World War broke out, a year before. Um, so they went back to Hong Kong, that's where his dad was based in, and he went to school. Hong Kong at the time was under British rule, it's a colonial rule. 
Uh, so the school system is a British school system. If you don't know what British school system is, just think of Harry Potter's movies. That's what the British school system looked like. Okay? Um, the British school system emphasized on this concept called muscular Christianity. It, that promotes sound mind and sound body. Okay? Uh, so there would be P classes as well as the traditional um, traditional uh, classes like English, mathematics, biology, and so forth and so on. He was never a good student. He always got into trouble, especially fights. In fact, let me see if I have this. No. His, he went to two different schools, both of Catholic denomination. They're they call private school. Uh, much like a lot of British system, although in British system they're called public school. Don't ask me why this is so. But the private school usually are run by um, uh, some kind of religious denomination. So the ones, the two schools that he went to was Catholic. I, on the other hand, went to Anglican. I was born in Hong Kong. And there's major, major rivalries between these schools. And from what I understand from my older classmates who are several several years ahead of me, they got in big fights. And Lee would be in some of them. Uh, it got so bad one time that he all nearly killed somebody. Um, so he was a troublemaker ever since his young days, younger days. However, he was very talented in terms of not school, it's not so much school, but in entertainment. Well, mostly because his father was a famous Chinese opera star who also appeared in Chinese movies. They're like Bollywood right now. They produce movies like several, you know, quite a number in a year. So he first appeared in a movie at age six. So it's not that he had no experience in the entertainment business. And in fact, before he actually got into the American uh, television, he already had 22 movies under his belt from age six. And one of his more famous movie, I remember watching it, was based on the re uh, adaptation of Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist. Um, so then he moved to United States 18, and this is the reason. This is shortly after he almost killed this one kid in a fight. And the police was looking for him, and his dad, who was so famous, pulled some strings, got him out, and basically said, you can't stay here. Um, and you gotta, you gotta leave. Since you have American citizenship, you gotta go to the United States. So, he, as I said before, he built a couple of martial art school in Seattle, although originally, because he first went to San Francisco, he was gonna build one there, and then he moved to Seattle, he couldn't take care of that, so he built another one in Seattle. Again, taking all comers. So, the first, he first got noticed uh, in the United States at the International Karate Championship. You notice that it's International Karate, which is a Japanese martial arts form, right? So he got into an International Karate Championship in Long Beach, California in 1964. He didn't compete. And you can, if you look, if you Google it, you will be able to find some footage of him at that competition. He didn't compete, it's a championship, but he didn't compete. What he was invited to do was to do a demonstration, which really struck everybody, no pun intended. At the time, the kind of abilities that he had, right? And Someone who was also attending that championship happened to be a Hollywood guy. So he basically contacted Bruce Lee later on and say and try to work some project out. Now, the other part of Bruce Lee is that even though he's a Chinese martial arts person, he all, he all, he thought that Chinese martial arts has limitations has limitation in the sense that 
it's too flowery. It's too much style, not enough substance. In other words, what he was thinking about is, if you actually got into a fight, whatever martial arts you learn is very limited because you keep remembering this and that. Well, in an actual fight, I'm not sure how many of you got into one, there's no such thing as, okay, I know that you're gonna hit me this way and then I'm gonna hit you that way. That doesn't happen that way. And also, it also from experience, remember I told you about him being challenged? He was very mad at himself that when one of the challenges, the first, first one of some of the challenges, he couldn't sustain it. He was out of shape. So he started reading extensively. Apparently he has one of the largest library in physical training, in physio exercise physiology and so forth. One of the largest library in his house in terms of how does Western style physical training actually help you to be fitter. So that is kind of a break from uh, the Chinese way of doing things. Now, not everything is hunky-dory with him. Well, the problem is that he always encounter race. Well, the Japanese occupied Hong Kong 1941 to 45, and it was brutal. Uh, if you ask Dr. Shin and Dr. Ho, who is South Korean, and they can tell you how horrific a Japanese treats their subjects whom they conquered uh, is bad as the Nazis. So he first, um, and, and the Japanese conquest is also race-based. And somehow the Japanese believe that they are better than anybody in Asia. And the justification is that in 1907, they beat Russia in a war. Russia was then considered a Western power and they defeated them in a, in a famous naval battle. That, that makes the Japanese feel very proud of themselves and think that they are better than anybody else because at the time, Asia, at this part of the century, Asia is pretty well divided by Western countries who, Vietnam by French, uh, Thailand English, India English, Hong Kong English, and there are eight countries in China who established territory that, that no Chinese rule can, um, can, can apply. That's including the United States. The United States have a piece of that. Uh, of course, the United States also have Philippines. Also, his experience during the school years under colonial rule. Uh, this is when the English, uh, British, would preach how the British Empire is so much more superior than anybody else because maybe justifiably so, because for a small island like Britain, they, they rule quite a number of places around the earth. Then there's this, he actually eventually married an American, Linda Lee uh, Caldwell, who by the way, lives in Boise. Um, his marriage to his wife was not smooth. Uh, his, her mother object to it. Her friends objected to it because he's Chinese. Heritage, not he's American, but he's Chinese heritage. So because of that, they objected. Uh, you want to know more, there's a, a movie called The Bruce Lee Story, uh, which was, uh, Linda Lee was a consultant, so her side of the story was probably closer to the truth um, of what she felt and how she feel her husband felt at the time. Uh, it was interracial marriage was frowned upon in the 1960s. And then, of course, when he was talking about, remember that championship that that Hollywood guy he talked to? He found out that there are very limited opportunities in the U.S. for Asians. Again, relegated to sidekicks or evil, stereotype evil characters. Um, in fact, how many of you remember there's a TV, long-running TV series back in the 70s called Kung Fu? starring David Gar Gar uh, Carradine, you can Google it. That was his thing, he, he wrote that. But then he was supposed to be him starring in it, but then they basically told him, well, the American audience will never, never watch a TV series with a Chinese as a main star. So they gave it to David Carradine, who was nowhere near a look like Chinese. 
So this is, these are all his encounters with race, but Li is a, was a very ambitious person. He believed the Chinese martial art is something to offer, and he believed that the best way to offer it, not by only building martial arts school, but the easiest way to do this is by mass entertainment, that you can, you can reach more people. So, being disappointed in America, trying his best to get into Hollywood, to promote his Chinese martial arts, well, and without success, and with rejection, and with betrayal, such as the Kung Fu series, he decided this is not the place to go, and he wanted to go back to Hong Kong. Well, he actually went back to Hong Kong because his father died. So he went back for a funeral, first time, and then contacted somebody in Hong Kong in the entertainment business. Well, little did he know that even though Green Hornet, by the way, the TV series where he was a psychic, only ran for one year, it was a huge hit in Asia, in Southeast Asia, in Hong Kong. Because for, for Chinese and Asians, they never seen an Asian regularly appear on television. And not only that, if you can Google some of that, and his martial art was unbelievable. The star of the movie, who's a Green Hornet, actually himself said, you know, yeah, I walked into the set, you know, it's pretty clear when the fight scenes go, who, he's gonna beat my, he's gonna beat the crap out of me, even though I'm supposed to be the main star. Like, I'm just pretending, and he actually knows his stuff, right? So he went back to Hong Kong, and he f signed with a company called Golden Harvest to do two films, contract, two films. The first one is called The Big Boss. Again, this is play every now and then on TV if you ever get a chance. So what is The Big Boss? Here's a storyline. This is a young man from rural China, went to work in Thailand, which really is not, really speaks to a lot of overseas Chinese, and that's what they do. And they, uh, people came here to San Francisco in 1840s, the 49ers, uh, to dig for gold. There are a lot of migrant Chinese come in to work on the railroad and so forth, do menial work, do laundry and all that kind of stuff. So it really speaks to a lot of Chinese who, because opportunities in China were so limited, they had to go outside their homeland to seek work and then send money back uh, for their family, which is pretty true for even today for a lot of immigrants, um, legal or illegal, uh, to come to the United States. But the workplace was a front of a drug lord um, who basically, by force or by persuasion, to make sure that the workers themselves do not know that they're actually smuggling opium. Now, this also hit a, a court with the Chinese because in the late 1800s, there's a famous war called the Opium War where the British forces China to open five ports. Hong Kong was one of them. That's why Britain got, uh, Brit uh, Hong Kong was under British rule. To open five ports so that they can import opium. The Chinese government banned it. The British said, no, no, this is a good thing uh, because it helps us in terms of our trade. Um, so we want you to open the port. So the Chinese government said, no. So the British said the naval. Uh, send the navy up uh, the river. Uh, there were two battles. The first one, the Chinese won, and the second one, they basically chased the Chinese all the way up to the capital. Um, so this speaks to the kind of inequality and imperialism and coloni colonialism happened around the time, which a lot of older generations, now this is 19, early, not early 1970s, which a lot of older generations still rem remembers. Now, despite all the injustices, uh, and the drug lord did kill some of the people there, he was constantly reminding not to make trouble. This is a Chinese characteristic as a people. You stay low, you keep your head low, you will survive. The key important is you survive. You make through another day. There'll be another day. Don't make trouble. Right? People make trouble, does not always come back alive. 
So this is kind of the philosophy that was subscribed by many, many Chinese at the time still, I would say still to some degree is still true. Except until, oh, wait a minute. Until he can't stand it any longer. And he fought the drug lord, killed him, killed all his minions, killed everybody else to avenge you know, his workers, his brothers and sisters, so to speak. So this is basically the storyline. Now this became a huge hit. It became a huge hit in Southeast Asia, in, in Hong Kong, and I'm not sure Korea, if that's okay, it is too. Like for Asians, this become a huge hit because it really speaks to a lot of the experience or the ancestors' experiences. Now, surprisingly, China didn't know anything about it because it wasn't open enough to have his movie shown there. So then the second movie is called The Fist of Fury. This is even worse, well worse, even better I should say. So this is loosely based on a historical figure who was murdered by the Japanese uh, for, because this guy was so good, he was winning all these martial arts competition. It, the, th that historical figure is true and he did die and there have been rumors that the Japanese poisoned him because they can beat him on the, uh, in, the, in the ring. So the main character, that's Bruce Lee's character, was his student and he's coming back to avenge. Now, Keep in mind, 71, 72, this is about 30 years after the Second World War. The memory of Japanese occupation in throughout the whole eastern, uh, the eastern seaboard of China uh, and, and uh, of the Asian continent is still very fresh. Uh, at, as a side note, my brother still refused to buy any Japanese cars today. Um, so the film actually, again, if you get a chance to see it, the film depicts a bullying of China by foreign powers, not just Japan, but other powers as well. Uh, not to the extent, of course, the Japanese is the main villain here during the first half of the 20th century. Um, and I will show you one example a little bit later on. And this really struck a chord with a lot of people. And then, of course, in the end, Lee will kill the main Japanese villain Right? But, and here's the but, he also got killed in the, at the end. At the end, if you've seen that movie, if you remember that movie, if you've seen that movie, you watch that movie, the ending was very much like the ending of Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid by Paul Newman and Robert Redford, that he came out with, under a hell of bullets. So these two really prompt Bruce Lee into superstardom and actually got him noticed in Hollywood. So he made his third, actually there was fourth complete movie he made. The, the other movie, um, Enter the Dragon, was made for Hollywood. We has a lot of uh, stereotyping of Chinese characters. But the way, and it is really a Warner Brothers co-production. Way of the Dragon, on the other hand, was all Bruce Lee. The first two movies, remember, he signed it with a movie company. This one, he wrote it, he produced it, he directed it, he acted in it. So this is all him. This movie, out of all the movies he made, really shows what Lee's thinking is all about. It has probably the clearest way of showing Lee's thinking about. Storyline. Okay. This young man, again, a yeah, young man from rural China, uh, went to work this time in Thailand, the location had changed in Rome. Now, this, actually the name, it becomes important. Tang Long. Now, this is a phonetic uh, thing for, for Western audience. Tang is actually the dynasty. It's a di name of the dynasty when China was probably those are two dynasties in Chinese history that China's power was so extensive. And there was multicultural, military, it's, like, it's, it's powerful, culturally it's powerful, literature, science, everything. So this is a, I believe, it's a purposely chosen name. In fact, we don't call ourselves Chinese, you call us Chinese. We call ourselves a people of Tan, 
is one of the dynasty, or people of Han, that's a, the other Chi dynasty. So this is his last name. Long is Dragon. Now Dragon, of course, that's Bruce Lee, that's his name. Long also, Dragon also means power in Chinese um, interpretation of the, of the word. It represents power. So the local criminals, supposedly mafia, they didn't really say that, uh, bully the restaurant owners so she would sell the business, right? And then Ten defended the business against first the thugs from the local gang and then martial arts mercenaries, which we'll see is, you will hear is a famous um, Chuck Norris at the famous Coliseum duel. Um, again, there's a lot, if you can pull it up on YouTube. So, the other part of this movie, which is kind of interesting, was the Mafia has guns, have weapons, and all these mercenaries, and Bruce Lee was just hands. So he's promoting how traditional Chinese way of doing things can overcome modernity. Even guns can kill them, right? So, this is a boring part for those of you who are, <laughs> this is a theoretical part. The way we, both Dr. Ryan look at this thing is we use Mazumi's uh, theory of mirror vision discourse. And basically, if I can summarize this, uh, when we watch a movie, it's two-dimensional because it's flat screen, okay? So, it's easy to stereotype. In fact, if you watch the movie and you watch TV, uh, it's a lot of stereotyping going on there, and you just kind of look at the characterization of the different characters that you see, right? So basically, the visual image becomes a one-dimensional character, but yet we all know that as people, we are more than one-dimensional, we're three-dimensional beings. So what he was saying is that, you know, when we watch these things, we need to use what he called the proprioceptive vision. In other words, we want to, these things, the movies can be looked at it if it, in if it elicits an emotional response when you watch it, then it's no longer one-dimensional. It becomes three-dimensional now because like, you're identifying with them somehow, in one way or another. Okay, so much for the boring stuff. So, what does that mean? What, what was his work look like? Well, number one, one of his thing about his movies is to counter the image of the sick men of Asia. This is in Fist of Fury. For those of you who can read, the two of you, it actually says the sick man of Asia. <laughs> and it is because China was at the time dominated by Western power, had no means of uh, resisting. In fact, China was forced to, pretty much like the indigenous people here, was forced to sign these unequal treaties. Uh, you give me this, but I'm not giving you anything, that kind of thing. Uh, so he is, his, his movie is work to counter this image that Chinese are not weak physically. Okay? In fact, in this scene, he actually made the Japanese eat this piece of paper after he beat the crap out of them. So in so doing, what it does is really heighten the national pride, if not ethnic pride of Chinese, both abroad and at home that we, are, we cannot be bullied, right? And, and Fist of Fury is a good example of that, uh, of that. At the same time, however, even though that we know we can beat the crap out of you, the movie is also demonstrate the traditional humility. In other words, we are not going to brag about this, but you know that if you do me wrong, there's consequences, right? But unlike, I said earlier, that one of the things about Chinese philosophy is keep your head down so that you can survive. Well, it's not that. It's also about proactive. In other words, we're not going to just stand here to take it. So it really combined the Eastern and Western way of thinking.
So his movies are really a result of his experience with the Chinese culture that, again, he doesn't subscribe to all of it. Colonialism, racism, and Western training methods. And then two results because of his movies. Number one, that the Chinese body is desirable. I can tell you now, I'm not sure how many of you watch tennis. Back about 10, 15 years ago, there's a Chinese pro tennis player named Michael Chang. Have you ever heard of him? 25, 25 years ago, before you were born. And even at that time, uh, one of the stars of the uh, pro tennis circuit basically said that, you know, Michael Chan will never win anything because he's Chinese. Basically, he didn't say it as such. Just because he's so small, he's not big enough, he's not strong enough, and it still happens. So, and of course in the movies, and this goes back way back, that somehow, and we stereotype things, Chinese body is not desirable. Not only in terms of sport, but in terms of sexuality. For, if you pay attention to movies, maybe not so, not so much now, the main character is always some white guy, right? And he's always coming in to save some white women. And that goes back to the first of the movies, The Birth of a Nation, which is really a glorified picture for the Ku Klux Klan, that one of the justification that the KKK is needed because the white women cannot defend themselves and need some white man to help them. So, so the white woman and white man is the norm. Right? That's desirable. So here is a clip. Family entertainment, okay? <laughs> okay, so this is the point I'm making. So there is another clip in uh, the Big Boss also have something similar, uh, except of course at that at that uh, that clip was of a Matai supposedly a prostitute. So the Chinese body is desirable. This is what be proud of your body. If you're Chinese, be proud of your body. Right? That's one of the things. The other part of it is that the Chinese body is powerful, it's not weak. We're not the weak man of Asia. 
And we are not going to be bullied. We're not going to be subservient to anybody. And we're not going to be afraid of anybody. Okay? So here is the... This is also from uh, Way of the Dragon. There's a little bit more than that, but I didn't show it. So, this clip here, when you watch the movie, there is no reason why this clip should be there. It, would, it wouldn't add to anything. It wouldn't subtract anything to the movie, other than the fact that he just wanted to show off his body. And in fact, in a later uh, documentary, some of the weightlifter, uh, some of the weightlifting crowd, basically said, you know, his body really became the type that the weight, the bodybuilders are striving towards now this triangular uh, shaped body becomes a norm. Uh, so his influence actually uh, it was more than just um, just on these uh, Chinese people. So this is, I think this is the end of this. So that was the, that's what we argue in our paper. That his movies really helped to promote traditional Chinese art, uh, form of uh, martial arts as well way of doing as well as he also promote uh, Western way of training to get to where you need to go. So in some sense Bruce Lee is the first fusion martial artist. Thank you. Thank you very much for this successful presentation. We have 15 minutes left so or you need to take notes and you missed it. <laughs> I can just tell you again. <laughs> it was a fun project for us. Yeah, I and I think of, whenever I think of Bruce Lee, I automatically think of Jackie Chan. Because it's kind of like just a position in many ways, like, like we do this a lot of times, like W.E. Boys and Booker T. Washington, and then Martin Luther King mm -hmm. versus Malcolm X. Yeah. So sometimes we, sometimes we have to compare these two people, like Bruce Lee mm -hmm. and Jackie Chan, and then I went. To, I, I read an article uh, from a newspaper that Jackie Chan idolized Bruce Lee when he was very young, and he was he was his role model in many ways. And then, interestingly, Jackie Chan recently has a great success in, in Hollywood. He's now a celebrity in America now, but he was once featured in a. In you know, an American movie in the early 1980s called Kill Em All. Mm -hmm, saw that. <laughs> in that movie... He had no speaking parts. Because he couldn't speak English. Yeah. And his role was very minor. Very minimal, and, yeah. Like, representing... Like, kind of in line of what Bruce Lee had faced uh, and uh, along of other Asian uh, actors, performers have faced similar thing, yeah. But that was in 1980s. Um, to to any everybody anybody who doesn't know who Jackie Chan is, okay, so you all know who he is. So you all you all know him, right? Okay, so first of all, an an anecdote. In Fist of Fury, the story about the Japanese bullying Chinese, the second movie he made, Jackie Chan's in it. If you look carefully, there's a fight scene in a Japanese dojo. When Bruce Lee kicked the crap out of everybody else, like he personally defeated 40 people. One of them is Jackie Chan. You look closely, he's there. <laughs> so he was, he, so he knew Bruce Lee, um, obviously. And, and uh, Bruce Lee, I think that Jackie Chan and Jet Li and other Asian actors who came after really have a lot to thank Bruce Lee who opened up the market for them. Uh, it didn't happen right away, right after he died, but eventually it did open up the market to at least have some, some role and even major roles 
uh, for them. But if you, if you want to be critical about this, if you remember all the Jackie Chan movies, he always have another co-star. It was never him being the only star in the Hollywood made, Hollywood based movies. In that sense that the progress been made, but it hasn't advanced to the point that American audience or Western audience accept the fact that there's this uh, in a Hollywood made movie that there's in these, this Asian character as a as a leading leading role. Robin? How is uh, Bruce Lee viewed in China? Right now, they build a, they build a statue for him. <laughs> uh, because the opening of China was pretty slow. And people don't really know his movies. It's like the moon landing in 1969, right? Uh, China, with 1.2 billion people, they didn't know that we landed somebody on the moon for the longest time. This is how close the society was at the time. So now they're catching up. See? So the uh, government sponsor television company actually recently, not recently, I think, about 10 years ago, made a Bruce Lee series based on his life. And then they built a statue of him and then now everybody want to adopt him as his native son. He's, he's uh, pretty revered. I mean, if you look at his movie, it's really promoting Chinese pride, Chinese nationalism. That didn't really criticize the kind of government or what governing system, whether it's communism, or socialism, whatever. It didn't really promote one or the other. So it, he was acceptable to the Chinese government. I'm not sure how he's receiving Japan, though. Well, the reason why I asked, I mean, I didn't even know he was born in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, he was born and then left. Because, like, of course, he was the troop, right? Yeah. Yeah, again, I, I think that if you get a chance, take a look at the Bruce Lee story, which was a, Linda Lee was the uh, consultant. I think in the in the movie they basically talked about when she dated him, how much negative comments came coming out from her friends and her, her mother. Um, and I would take it that she would know. She's the one who had to. And, and if the movie is anything correct to, is accurate to what she experiences. Her mother's perception of her son-in-law did not improve until they have a, ch a child, Brendan Lee. Then the grandmother kicks in. I have two. Sure. One's more factual and the other one's... Um, okay. I can probably that. make up the facts for you. Um, when you say that he was a Chinese martial artist, what disciplines in particular are you talking about? Wing Chun. He studied under Ip Man, who is supposed to be this famous uh, martial artist. And Ip Man at the time in Hong Kong, he's already retired. He would not take any student. But because of his father, who begged him, because he was always getting in trouble, uh, so he begged him, and, and Ip Man said, OK, I will make that exception. I will take him. Now, funny enough, Wing Chun, Wing Chun as a, not the song, Wing Chun as the as a style was actually created by a woman, by a nun, by a Buddhist nun. So it is about if you are not strong enough, you're not that, you're not, you cannot overpower, how can you fight back? So that actually, that's a style. And, and then, uh, hang on, and then he developed his own. Yeah. My other question, which is more complex, and may not have enough time here, but when you were talking about the kind of fusion of of cultures and mm -hmm. overcoming of stereotypes. I was thinking of the recently released uh, O.J. Simpson documentary that came out, like mm. that recent now, it came out last summer, I think. But um, the central thesis of that was that, um, you know, sport can be this vehicle for a marginalized person and O.J. Yeah, right. yeah, me, yeah. to overcome his race, to overcome his yeah. class. Mm -hmm. um, but there are limits to that, and yes. that once he sort of conformed to the dark side of the prevailing stereotype, right. um, that 
all of that cultural capital that he had built up just sort of vanished. Right. Now, I guess my open-ended question then is, how does your study of Bruce Lee sort of confirm or extend or contradict that thesis? I don't think it can confirm or contradict because he didn't live that long. Because he, his first movie is about 72 and then he died I know he died before I left. 73. 73. Yeah, he's, his, his career is really short-lived. I mean, it's meteoric, but it's very short-lived. So the impact at the time was really huge. Now, had he lived longer, we're just like guessing now, how would he react to being a Hollywood star, assuming that it's the trajectory? We don't know. I mean, we can only guess. Uh, would he conform? I don't know either. Um, I, I really cannot. I there's one thing about historian. We can know the past and explain why we get here, but we cannot predict the future. Otherwise, I would be very rich. Uh, uh, so I, I can't really answer that question. But I, the best to my guessing is this. I think culture, uh, for those of you who study sociology, and you will remember, I mean, this is like kind of the spider web case or the iron cage, as Peter Berger says, that we are product of culture and yet we make culture. So how strong is, will he be in terms of determining how people see him and how he's going to react? Uh, it's anybody's guess. But I would imagine that that would be some influence on, on him. And after he died, and, and I kind of mentioned this, that kind of perception of Chinese, whether it's acceptable to the larger society here in the United States, remains still a problem uh, even until Jackie Chan came as a big star, so to speak. He doesn't have a primary leading role. There's no movie that he is the major star there. Uh, what are the, some of the movies? Rush Hour was with, what's his name? Chris Tucker. Chris Tucker, and then the other one was uh, the cowboy movie, um, the Shanghai Nights or whatever, it was with Will Olsen. It's always somebody else with them, right? So I'm not sure, and it, 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 it's very difficult to overcome, no doubt. Now, would he, if that's the case, would he say, okay, I give up. I'll play evil character or I'll play whatever, I don't know. I mean, that's anybody's guess.